Hey y'all, so today's video is a quick guide for anyone new to the XR industry looking to get into virtual or augmented reality development. I'm gonna go through some definitions, some hardware, some software, and some decisions that you'll need to make pretty early on in your journey of development. So going straight into it, we have XR, which is the umbrella term, meaning extended reality. We have AR, which more or less is a digital representation of data overlaid on top of your reality around you. Um, so any type of data that you see with a pass-through camera, that type of stuff. Mixed reality, there's a bit of a blurry line between MR and AR sometimes, but the idea of mixed reality is that you also have the pass-through into the real world of seeing everything around you, but the digital objects that you're interacting with have context and contextual awareness of the world around you. So if you're bouncing a ball on a tabletop and your table in front of you is a real table that's there and the ball is digital, the fact that that ball knows that the table is there and can bounce on it and then roll off and hit your floor that's physically there is because it has contextual awareness, because it has some understanding of what's around you. That's MR. Virtual reality then is full immersion into another environment. So that would be headset on, completely immersed somewhere else, and it doesn't have any contextual awareness of your physical location other than perhaps some scans of the walls around you to provide some safety guidance. For the sake of this conversation, I'm just going to refer to them as VR and AR. MR to me has kind of been lumped into AR. There's also some new categories like spatial computing that I talked about in a previous video, um, but for ease of use and conversation, let's just call it VR and AR today. So how might you see XR used? Usually it's in use cases that incorporate training, simulation, entertainment, utility tools, uh, collaboration, and overall experiences. Between the two, you see VR take on more of the immersive training, collaborative environments, and enabling agency for the end user. Um, so the feeling that you truly have an impact on the environment around you. Augmented reality is going to be much better at context and marketing, gaming, and accessibility. Um, the accessibility really driving a lot of the others that it's, it's a good marketing tool and a good tool for gaming because AR devices are accessible. So in which industries might you see XR? Industries that I personally have used it would be aerospace, automotive, engineering, design, manufacturing, retail, architecture and construction, and games. If you want to create an augmented reality app yourself, how do you go about that? So the first option for creating your own augmented reality apps is using a game engine. Uh, I don't say Unity only because I work at Unity and I know Unity extremely well. I say it more so because Unity to me is the engine to use if you want to develop AR. Um, there are other engines out there, but Unity to me is the front runner in the augmented reality space. Then you have some purveyors of asset storage like Echo 3D that will be like a 3D dam or repository that allow you to see your 3D data in augmented reality form, which is pretty neat. Uh, you have SDKs like AR Foundation, encompassing AR Kit and AR Core. You have apps like Snapchat that has Snap Studio, where you can create your own AR apps. Third-party plugins like Vuforia. Um, typically, I just put in parentheses there that the difficulty I've seen is that it runs into fees. Um, so at a certain point, at a certain utilization, it's difficult monetarily. And then you have web tools like 8th Wall. Uh, that not only can you work in a web browser, but also enables augmented reality through the web. So how can you create virtual reality apps? Uh, usually a game engine is where I would start as well. I would open up the landscape from just Unity to Unity and Unreal Engine for virtual reality development. You also have groups like Matterport that are doing scan visualization. So you do a 3D scan and then you put a headset on and you can walk around the environment that you've scanned. You have web-based tools like Babylon.js, 3.js, etc. that make for really good, quick, lightweight configurators, things like that. You have 3D content creation tools like Maya, 3DS, Blender, uh, etc., which will allow you to put a headset on and do some very basic design review stuff. 
Then you have true design review tools like VRED or VRED and SketchUp. Um, in those, they have some plugins built that you can put the headset on and get in and see what you've made up close and personal. Last thing here are third-party apps like Meta Horizon Worlds, a uh, third-party app that you can get into and start to make. So for the sake of the rest of this conversation, I'm just going to zoom in on game engines because that's what I know best. It's what I use all the time. Um, so game engines is where I want to take this. So now that we've said, okay, we want to use a game engine, how do we know which one we want to use? So the reality is if you speak to anybody in the industry and they say Unity is better or Unreal is better or Godot is better or 3JS is better, period, they're uninformed or they're, they're informed but trying to skew what they're saying. The reality is that there is absolutely no engine that will always be the right choice. You have to work backwards from what you're trying to do and where you're wanting to deploy your solutions to know what's going to be right for you. So looking at specifically Unity and Unreal, which to me are the two main front runners in the game engine world, looking at the pros and cons of each. So we have Unity that really excels at low end chipsets and hardware. They have a large community of creators, so there's a ton of data and forums out there. It's also an engine that's using C Sharp, so it's typically a little bit easier to get up to speed on, and I've found more of a uh, robust talent pool using C Sharp rather than other languages. Uh, there's also a little bit of node-based VFX and shader work, uh, but node-based is not Unity's core feature, I would say. You also have a flat license, which is a kind of an expected amount of payment that you can expect for your license tier every year, minus the runtime debacle that was announced and then retracted. The other negative that I see with Unity is just that there isn't a group at Unity that's publishing games made inside of the engine, uh, and I think that Unreal does a really good job of that, having full games like Fortnite created in their engine, uh, which can be vetted and tested and push the engine forward. Um, so that's a negative for Unity is that they don't have published games made by Unity in Unity. For Unreal Engine, really the core here is that it's a focus on console, desktop, and high-end graphics processors. They have a lot of advanced rendering tech like Nanite and Lumen that are fantastic and extremely impressive. It uses C++ and Blueprint. So C++ to me is a bit less accessible than C Sharp. And blueprints I like a lot, but I've found in speaking with programmers that blueprints can quickly become wild, tangled messes of noodle blueprint nodes that are all pointing to each other and it gets very confusing to read and it can be difficult to create simple operations using blueprints. Uh, Unreal does take a percent of profits after X amount of profit. I don't recall the percentage or the amount of profit where that starts to kick in but they do have a scaling profit take. Um, so it's been a, a bit of a profit share type thing. Uh, last thing with Unreal, especially as I come from the aerospace and defense industry, is that Unreal struggles in the intellectual property and defense spaces, uh, typically because their ownership is uh, 40 to 50% outside of the United States. Uh, it makes it a little bit difficult to have conversations. And if you're working in aerospace, automotive, defense, etc., typically Unreal is a not a great option for that reason. So for the sake of this conversation, again, you can make the argument that Unreal is the right one for you, depending on what you're doing. But for me, because Unity is really good at low-end chipsets and hardware, meaning I can build for the lowest common denominator and ship out to a bunch of different types of headsets and phones. The fact that it has a bunch of creators in the community and a bunch of forum posts that I can query and search and find out how I should be writing something, and the fact that it has C Sharp and some node-based VFX and shader work, those to me make it the right choice for XR. So assuming that we've chosen Unity for our XR development, okay, great. So then where do I start? What I would recommend is starting with Unity Learn, which is a free online tutorial website made by Unity, maintained by Unity, with a bunch of tutorials. They have full augmented reality courses, they have full virtual reality courses, etc. 
There's also the Unity forums, um, where a lot of really good questions and answers are posted. Then you have templates built into Unity. So if you open the Unity Hub, go to Create, New, inside of your project templates, you can select a, a lot of different types of templates in the XR space, like multiplayer, core VR, etc. And you can get in and have a lot of this preset up for you. The last one, of course, without being self-aggrandizing, is YouTube. I'm always more than happy to help out, as well as a bunch of other creators on here. So a quick hardware overview. You have head-mounted displays, which typically are going to fall into full virtual reality. You have hybrid, so somewhere between VR and AR, and then you have AR. So within VR, you tend to have tethered and untethered. So a tethered headset would be a Valve Index, an HTC Vive Pro, a Sony PSVR 2, etc. Use cases here typically being high-end gaming, high-end simulation, and they're tethered, meaning they're plugged into your large desktop because they need that processing power. Then you have untethered, like the MetaQuest 3, and the use cases there are typically, it's very easy to use, it's portable, and it's meant for middle-end gaming experiences. I say middle-end because it doesn't need to be plugged into anything. It's running all the compute on the headset, so there are some limitations there. With hybrid, I said semi-tethered here. Typically what you'll find with things like the Apple Vision Pro and the announced Project Muhan is that whether it's a tether going to a battery or a tether going to a compute, um, the idea is that there's typically something that's in your pocket that you have to use in some way that's off of the headset. This is typically meant to be used in a personal computing, spatial computing, around the house use case. Then you have augmented reality headsets. Uh, so that would be kind of in all of the above. You'll see tethered, untethered, semi-tethered, etc. HoloLens is an example of an untethered. Magic Leap 2 is an example of a tethered where the, the processing was happening uh, in your pocket and the small device that would be feeding up to the headset. Then you have devices also like the X-Real that is a more or less a display that needs something powering the display that you have to plug into, but the display itself is just glasses that have a cable that comes out and plugs into something. A lot of these lean into that innovation use case. So augmented reality, non-head mounted display. Typically you're going to see things like standard cameras. So in the retail space, you have your home webcam where you can do things like virtual try on. I literally bought the pair of glasses I'm wearing through a virtual try on website using my webcam that showed me what the glasses would look like before I had to buy them. Or you'll see it using standard cameras in the experiential space. So kiosks at the Maverick Stadium or at the American Airlines booth or at DFW Airport um, might have brand activations, mascot activations, marketing, etc. Uh, there's also CES and show floor engagement that you can drive through augmented reality displays that live in a static booth, something like that. Then you have handheld. So your typical, what you'd think of with uh, your iPhone, your iOS devices, Android devices, tablets, phones, etc. And typically they fall into either a utility tool use case for measuring and translating or they fall into an entertainment use case for things like Snapchat, Go, Pokemon Go, et cetera. Then you have projection-based. So this one is really interesting. Things like AccuVein, where in the medical space, they can overlay where your veins are um, using a projector so that it's easier for anyone to, to get in and do what they need to do. Magic Dynamics and other types of more entertainment-leaning uh, game floor-projected experiences that you may have seen at a a bowling alley or at a mall where they have a projected floor game that, that kids and adults can play with. You have things like hollow gauze, which is almost like a spider web material that you can project into and communicate kind of a 3D depth. You also have old school projection based ideas like Pepper's Ghost. So back in the day in theater, you could have someone standing off stage, but using a clever series of mirrors and tricks. You could effectively project someone off stage, on stage as if they're there. Use cases here get into medical viz, manufacturing guidelines if someone's out on the shop floor needing to know what the next step is on laying up a composite. That's the idea. Or even entertainment. 
So then I just listed other technologies here, things to be aware of. So you have immersive screens, you have interactive screens like Sony's spatial reality, Z space, and the cave that some of you have probably seen. Use cases here usually fall into more educational and tooling. Then you have passive immersive screens, um, which really I just put here for now, a passive 3D monitor, 3D screen. The nice thing here is that it can be used for group experiences, whereas the interactive piece of this usually has to track the main viewer, meaning it can only be used by one person at a time um, so that it gets all of the perspective and parallax right, whereas passive, it doesn't need to track you. So it can be used for 100 people instead of one. Then you have peripherals, which is basically any miscellaneous item that works in tandem with VR or AR. So it could be gloves, boots, uh, a 3D interactive pen, etc. Here I listed out things like B Haptics, Haptic X, Driver X, which are all gloves. Manus is another type of glove. Logitech MX Ink, which is a 3D pen in space that allows you to paint and draw in space. And the idea here is that they're giving you true immersion and agency. As a quick definition, Haptics more or less is anything that gives you force feedback. So if you feel something like a rumble or a push back on you, um, typically that is adding that next layer of realism that you'll want to get out of your experience. Last thing that I have called out here is IoT and robotics. So things like connected devices, Samsung smart fridges, Amazon Astro, home robot, Boston Dynamics spot, things like that. The idea here is that you have XR devices paired with utility tools with throughout your house that are all connected through IOT. And here you could do things like have on your Apple vision pro and change your thermostat. That's the idea. So there's a bunch of technology here. Which one do you pick? Which one do you want to run with? And really it all comes back to what does success look like for your app is going to be what you need to think about. So how many people are you trying to reach? What's your target audience? What's your target budget? What size team do you have? If you have a team of one, you probably don't want to pick four of these technologies to jumble into one thing. But there are a lot of questions that you have to start to ask yourself. So when it comes to tech, there's really not a way to say this is the right tech in most cases. Um, typically, you just need to ask yourself some questions and come back to this guide to understand the pros and cons and use cases of each of these types of tech. And then you can start to jump in from there. So that's it for me for today. I just wanted to do a quick overview and hopefully this serves as a good guide for anyone getting into this space to understand what these things are and the types of questions that you should be asking yourself and the types of use cases that these might be deployed in. Thanks for watching. I hope you're having a great day. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see y'all in the next one.